Okay, everyone. So this is going to be kind of an open, fairly unstructured uh, session. Uh, it's kind of, I would say, very much in the spirit of the black hole initiative. You know, we all love black holes. We believe in black holes. But we also keep, I would say, a healthy skepticism on whether black holes are real or not. And so the question we want to, I, I can call it debate, or maybe just talk about, have a conversation about is, have we really seen black holes? If not, what do we need to do to show that they are black holes? Or is it the case that we can never show that they are really black holes? Or is this a wrong question, right? I mean, any of this is, a, I think, a, a perfectly valid uh, point of view. And so mostly what I'm looking forward to is that people in the audience will speak, no slides. There is a whiteboard in case somebody really wants to come and write something, but mostly it's going to be just a conversation. However, there's a little structure right in the beginning, no more than 10 minutes. Basically, I'm going to start with some comments from myself, and then I'm going to call four people from the audience to give very brief comments from their own points of view. So for instance, Alessandra will tell us about what gravitational waves can contribute to this question. Then Shiraz Minwala is going to tell us from the point of view of, uh, I want to say high energy physics. He, he's high energy in many respects, as you know. Uh, then I'm going to ask <laughs> Mutao Wang to you know, give us a few comments from the point of view of a mathematician. And Carl Heffer will tell us you know, from a philosophy point of view, what are the right questions, how do we answer them, et cetera. But nobody is restricted to, you know, what they actually discuss, and I'm hoping that each of you will take no more than a minute, because then I want to make this open, and pretty much I would invite everyone to contribute their thoughts. And don't worry about, you know, whether you're straying from the point or whatever. Mostly we just want a conversation, okay? So that's the idea. So let me give you a little background from the astronomy perspective. Astronomers have believed now for many years that we have found black holes. And the argument is quite simple. We have certainly found relativistically compact objects. Example, Laura Brenneman showed there's clear evidence that things are moving at velocities close to the speed of light. So you need something very compact. We have also found clear evidence that many, if not most, of these objects are rather massive. Even the so-called stellar mass black holes are at least five solar masses and typically much more. And we hear from the physicists that a neutron star cannot be more than two and a half or three solar masses. So the argument is very simple. Look, we've got relativistic object. It cannot be a neutron star. What else? It must be a black hole. Okay, so at that level, everybody seems to be happy. Some of us have looked for a little bit more evidence. So like, for instance, Avi and I, and some of us said, can we show that these guys, these objects, actually have event horizons? And the answer is yes, up to a point. What we can show is they don't have normal surfaces, normal baryonic matter that can emit electromagnetic radiation. Those kinds of objects are ruled out up to a point, I'll mention in a second. We cannot rule out compact objects with a surface which are exotic. Right? A fuzzball or a gravis star or a firewall or whatever. If it doesn't emit electromagnetic radiation, our observations cannot limit it. Secondly, even if it is a normal surface, if the surface is too close to the Planck scale from the horizon so that the redshift is too large, we cannot put a limit. So we can only put a limit up to a certain large redshift, but not quite quantum gravity large. Okay? So that's about all that I'm going to say about what astronomy can do. Let me invite Alessandra to tell us where we are with LIGO. You just sit down and just talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no, it's gravitational waves. It's neither astronomy <laughs> nor physics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a new so, field. So just uh, in a minute, because you told me one yes, minute. One minute. So I can just uh, uh, open the discussion on perhaps three points. So one overlaps with what you just said about the masses of this object that we observed and the fact that they coalesce at the frequency such that if we just use Newtonian uh, you know, uh, gravity, they have to be compact to uh, arrive, uh, you know, they, 
they have to be very close just before merger, and the only object that we know can be neutron star or black hole, the mass excluded neutron star for many of the events that we have seen. So the other important thing is that by analyzing the data um, with um, uh, models uh, of uh, uh, binary black hole from numerical simulation, analytical relativity, etc., uh, the signal is consistent, uh, not just at low frequency, but overall the evolution going through the in spiral, it in spiral, merger in down with a solution from, uh, you know, the Einstein equation uh, for black holes. And the other important thing is what I was uh, uh, saying yesterday in my, in my talk, but I want to emphasize one important thing, uh, the damping of the uh, ring down, which is very much consistent with uh, the travel, uh, the light crossing time of the sides of this compact object with that mass, which we don't see um, I mean, if you consider a compact object with matter, for example, neutron stars, in all the simulations that people have done of a merger of two neutron stars, uh, a neutron star would not dump, um, the signal would not dump in this, on the same time scale, but much longer. So the fact that the signal that we have seen until now has that kind of, uh, you know, damping time is very also specific of a black hole and not an object which has matter. So these are the three points. Okay, Shiraz. It seems to me that, um, I mean, we clearly know, well, uh, if, you, if you've got objects that behave exactly like black holes are predicted to behave in, in general relativity, you get all the predictions right, like Al Alessandra said. Um, for instance, for merging black holes, and let's say we have a lot of data from LIGO and LISA and so on. Um, I think you, we're, we're clearly, we, we will, we will certainly be able to deduce maybe 10, 20, 50 years from now that black holes exist from that point of view. However, there's a, there's a potential caveat. And the caveat is, what if the black hole is the solution of general relativity up to and outside the event horizon, but is something different at or maybe inside the event horizon? Um, maybe that's, you know, that's an interesting question for which uh, uh, observations uh, probably will not easily be able to give an answer. It seems to me that the only way you will really understand, the only practical way to understand this on a short time scale is through theory. For instance, the ADS-CFT correspondence could give you, which is, which we believe is a complete, complete description of, uh, you know, the, 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 the worry here is that, as people have some raised, that quantum effects at the event horizon and near the event horizon give rise to uh, give, give rise to behaviors that are very different from classical effects in general relativity. Now, you may or may not find it plausible, but people have raised this possibility, and it's not been definitively killed. Okay, so it seems to me that the really reasonable way of understanding what's going on here is to have a complete, to work, work out what we know in a complete quantum theory of gravity. ADS-CFT is a great example. And I can imagine, um, I can imagine that in a few years time scale, um, theory will be able to, within, at least within that toy model of gravity, give you a clear answer to the question of whether black holes behave like black holes all the way down to near the singularity. Thank you, Shiraz. Mutao Wang. Well, uh, well, I think, first of all, most math mathematicians uh, don't have problems with the reality of black holes. But of course, uh, we live in a very different uh, reality from uh, all other people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as Lydia pointed out uh, yesterday, I think um, well, a very important uh, advancement in the past few decades uh, in mathematics is the understanding of uh, uh, nonlinear partial differential systems, for example, uh, the Einstein equation. So uh, in terms of this, I think uh, what we would like to see is uh, rigorous and uh, more general theorems about um, the formation of black holes. Um, and the stability of black holes. In the full nonlinear context of Einstein equation and uh, subject to initial data and boundary data. Okay. So we hope to have a more um, characterization of how black hole forms and if they form, uh, whether they are stable or not. Okay. Thank you. Carl? So, so the question of how we can be sure black holes exist um, needs to be clarified first by um, saying whether you're interested in the question about a singularity. Um, 
uh, or just that uh, the general relativistic description of the event horizon is, is accurate. And in, in the latter, let's, let's assume it's the latter sense, um, then I, I kind of agree with every, everything that's been said, but would, would uh, make one small remark about when you go from confidence to, to saying we know something. Um, so when you have predictions that are borne out by the, the data excellently well, then you are tempted to make what we call an inference to the best explanation, the best explanation for all these um, measurements coming out the way that uh, general, relativity, general relativity predicts is that the description is right and it's a black hole. Um, under determination, which was mentioned by Andreas, uh, makes philosophers nervous about that simple inference with just that uh, basis. Uh, it might be that there's some other theory that would give the, basically the same predictions that we haven't stumbled upon yet, but say something quite different perhaps about the very event horizon itself or what happens in the inside. Um, so my own view about this is that the best thing would be to go right up to one and, and, and do all sorts of direct tests about it. But until we can do that, the, the, the way that you overcome the doubts uh, about underdetermination and so forth is by triangulating and just getting as many different independent paths to check um, that things are behaving at the event horizon the way that, uh, the way that you would expect if it's a black hole as you possibly can. And that seems to me to be exactly what the physics community is doing. Great. Thank you, everyone. So now it's kind of open to the floor. So please, yeah, here. Um, so, so I guess with apologies to some of the previous people, so let me make a, I mean, I think the word proof is, is not a word that we use in science. Uh, you know, proof is, you know, we prove Pythagorean, the Pythagoras' theorem. We don't prove that black holes exist. You know, uh, in science we are Bayesians and we can increase our confidence, you know, if we had to bet that certain statements are true, and that's it. And honestly, I, I'm actually curious. So does anyone in this room think, have less than 99.9% .9 confidence that the object in Sagittarius A star is a black hole? I, cer I mean, certainly not, I don't have less than that. But I, I mean, I, it seems to me like this discussion, are there black holes? It's an interesting discussion. That was a discussion for the 70s. I mean, by now, I think uh, almost everyone would have at least that confidence, if not higher, <laughs> that in fact there is a black hole there. J just for the simple reason that there's no reasonable alternative that has been proposed. And you can always say, oh, well, if there could be something else that we don't understand, and that's always true, and that's why we're Bayesians, and that's why we never prove anything. But I mean, come on, right? Uh, you know, to the extent that we know anything, you know, I think we're probably pretty confident that uh, there are black okay. holes. Very good. Wait a minute. Oh, you want, you, what, oh, you want me to actually give you my prior? I, I think uh, Eric had uh, his hand up earlier. Yeah. I don't know. Ten, ten, ten to minus six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eric. So, uh, I, mean, I, 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 I'm sorry. I have some sympathy with what Dan is saying. Uh, well, except for the remark that we're all Bayesians. I'm not a Bayesian. Um, <laughs> I've had this argument with people. Uh, but I, I, think, I think that, um, I, I still think that there is though, more to talk about than, than, than what Dan is suggesting. And it's along the lines of a remark, a very brief remark at the very beginning of what Carl said. And that is implicit in a lot of what a lot of other people have said, which is, um, I, it's, I don't think the question is actually very clear yet. Because when you talk to people in different communities, talk to astrophysicists, you talk to mathematicians, you talk to theoretical physicists, you talk to philosophers, and you ask them, what is a black hole? They give you radically different answers. You know, some people will say, you know, if, you, if, if you ask Bob Wald, he'll say it's the, you know, it's the, it's the boundary of the, it's the, it's the, bound, the causal boundary of the past of future null infinity. If you talk to Ramesh, he'll say it's a relativistically a compact object of greater than four solar masses. You know, if, if you talk to some mathematicians I know, they'll say it's an apparent horizon with a singularity because they're interested in, in initial data uh, problems. And if you, uh, if you talk to uh, some other astrophysicist I know, they'll say, well, it's just a region of space that nothing escapes from. And if you talk to other people, they'll say, well, it's a, it's a dynamical trapping horizon or, or an isolated horizon. And these are, all in a, these are all interesting and valuable answers, but they actually are large, they, many of them are inconsistent with each other. The assumptions one has to make to give the definition don't all fit together. So it's not so it's it's not even clear to me yet what's being asked when someone says is Sagittarius a you know Sag a star is that a black hole? Well, I, I want to hear in more detail what exactly you mean by that. <laughs> 
No, this is for the audience to decide. What is the question? Uh, but I think Neil had his uh, hand up earlier, then we'll come. Oh. So in terms of what are we trying to determine here, I certainly wouldn't be hoping to uh, probe whether there's a singularity, kind of keep it in the realm of something we might be able to do, and that is, you know, are we actually really seeing an event horizon? That's then separate from saying, is it the event horizon of general relativity, or is it an event horizon just in general? Um, one of the problems is, if you look at the kinds of experiments that we're able to do, the observations, whether it's uh, gravitational waves or things like the Event Horizon Telescope, and I think really the real name for the Event Horizon Telescope should be the Light Ring Telescope, it's just not as catchy. Um, and the same goes, as you would have heard in <coughs> uh, Alessandra's talk yesterday, things like the quasi-normal behavior and everything is really determined at the properties of the Light Ring, not really at the Event Horizon, so you know, getting in to really probe what's distinctly different about having an event horizon versus uh, having a light ring. It's, uh, you know, I think what we're really probing with these experiments right now is a light ring. Yeah, very good, please. Yeah. Uh, it's quasi-normal ringing. Uh, is a feature that can only happen in black hole, black hole merger, or it can happen in other kind of uh, scenarios? Yeah, you can have a sufficiently compact object so that you can have a light ring that exists and you're going to have, you know, uh, the same kind of behaviors happening. Right. Okay. So, Avi, did you have a question? <coughs> yes. Yeah, just a comment. And I think Gary. Yeah, there are lots of hands. So I'll, <laughs> I'll come, I'll get to you all in course of time. <laughs> so there okay. is this uh, basic question, how do we know that uh, China exists without visiting China? Right. <laughs> Um, and we can argue forever, <laughs> and some people will define it differently, but the point is, uh, the best proof would be to visit it, and I, I encourage uh, Shiraz... Um, to go into the black hole. To, uh, <laughs> to uh, if he has doubts that uh, the <laughs> there is something just behind the event horizon, uh, there are travel agencies offering a one-way ticket. <laughs> 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 That's true. But you will be, so if, if you know that uh, you have a certain amount of time to live, I mean, I would board that spacecraft and as long as uh, we can travel that far. I mean, so far the nearest black hole is how many light years away, Ramesh? It's quite far, yeah. 6,000. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we cannot make it we, in one generation. We have to uh, travel for a while, but eventually that will be the ultimate proof, right? Crossing the horizon and seeing. Yeah. And, and crashing at the singularity. Right. No, but seriously, if, if you do that, if you do that, you convince yourself, but nobody who stays outside. That's the problem. You are, you are satisfied. You are satisfied, but uh, the, the next generation, <laughs> it's, okay. it's like kamakatsi. <laughs> yeah, no, no, here. Shiraz, here. Okay. Gary, yeah. Okay, I, I think we shouldn't forget that what's driving most of these alternative uh, pictures, the fuzzballs, graph stars, and stuff, is the black hole information puzzle. I mean, I, I think if it wasn't for that, you know, nobody would be thinking about alternatives to black holes. They would just be obvious and everybody would be happy and most of us are still happy, but there's a segment of the community that's very worried and, and it, the fact is there are three things that we know to be true that are mutually incompatible. And, and so that something we know to be true is just false. And that's the fact that when you fall into a black hole, nothing happens at the horizon. The other is when black holes evaporate, all the information comes out. And finally, outside a big black hole, ordinary quantum field theory should hold outside the horizon. And we know those three things can't all be true. So, so I think that's what's driving some of these, you know, sounding, you know, outrageous sounding alternatives uh, for people who are trying to understand that. So Peter, you had a comment? Uh, one thought that uh, occurs to me is that sometimes we take it to, for granted that it's all been calm in the history of establishing the reality of scientific objects in the past. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about black holes, invidiously is not doing what we've done before, the way hacking sometimes says, you know, well, we just manipulate objects and then we define them as real, uh, that that's actually pretty, pretty much not true. And uh, as much as I respect Hacking's work, and he's a colleague and friend for, for many years, but if you look, for example, at the history of physics, 
there have been moments when we have new forms of demonstration that we didn't have before. Statistical argument in physics is a very recent thing. Late 19th century, astronomers were doing it, but not physicists. It's a, it's a sort of quantum mechanical era. It's the first time people began to put error bars on their demonstrations. If you think about the history, I mean, in much more recent history of quarks, you know, there was, a, I remember a lot of debate among physicists and philosophers. Are quarks real if we can't isolate them? And then, you know, well, deep inelastic scattering and quantum chromodynamics, and we satisfied ourselves, both philosophically and, and in physics, that we would call them, we were happy to identify them as real, even though we couldn't isolate them, uh, separated from, from their friends. So um, I think that, you know, this is something that's gone on for a long time in physics. So the, one of the things that troubles people is not only the inability to probe the center of a black hole, but that all of our information about it seems somehow indirect, as if there was something, there's some elusive directness that we almost, that we have everywhere else. Well, you know, yes and no. And I think that we have to look at the history of how we establish the reality of physical objects as having a long and varied past, and it shouldn't be any more surprising that it's gonna take new methods with black holes than it is that it took new methods with quarks. Excellent point. I think Satya had a question. I'm going to say a couple of things which reflect what other people are saying. I want to just start by saying we'll never ask, we don't ask ever, is the moon really there? Yeah. And that goes back to your point of establishing some confidence which is irrevocable. There is no deal, right? There's no, there's no more question about it. So the kind of, that's the kind of, um, yardstick that we used for detection of gravitational waves themselves. Two things here. One, we have to ask the question, what is not a black hole? Instead of asking what is a black hole, we got to ask what is not a black hole? Tell us what, it is, what is not, and then we can look for those signatures. And one of the experiments that Lisa is going to do is to measure the multipole moments to exquisite precision. We can't look inside a black hole, but I don't think we need to. We don't look inside, a, inside the sun to conclude what is burning. So you don't have to do that, but at least if there are predictions as to what the object is, we can look for that. That's the only thing that we could do. And so with that uh, philosophy, it is good to, first of all, if you think that these objects are not black holes, predict that, you know, tell us what they are not. Maybe there is a surface, maybe there is extra hair. Some of these things we are looking for already from measurements in LISA and LIGO and so on. I think that's the direction to pursue, to prove black holes only in a statistical manner, but not in a mathematical manner, I believe. Thank you. Andreas, you had a comment? Please. First of all, I have to, I have to agree. Uh, we cannot prove that there is a black hole. That's not, I think that's not possible. We can on, only reach a maximum agreement amongst our, ourselves <clears throat> whether something we see or measure is indeed a black hole. So we need a good definition of it. That's one thing. On the other hand, if you look into the literature, um, it was very hard for people, and till today it's probably not possible, for instance, to define what a chair is. Right? A chair may have four legs, it may have three legs, it may have one leg. It may look completely different. It may be just be used as a chair. And uh, so even, even defining very simple things um, is very difficult. So to, to, to actually prove something or to define that something is something else is very, very difficult. The, the other thing I would like to say is um, what people always forget is what I think is true, um, that physics as such is only description. Right? We only describe what we measure. We have a, a sort of picture of the world, but we don't actually get at the things. So the best thing we can do is we can come up with a, with a um, description of something and with a maximum agreement between the way we describe it and what we measure. And if we are lucky, we can even predict something on the basis of that, um, of that model, and then we're very happy. So I doubt that we will ever get at the true nature of things. We can only talk about descriptions. Alessandra, you had some yeah, comments. So I just wanted to make a comment what uh, uh, Gary was saying about uh, the quantum information problem. Um, 
the fact is that until now, I mean, with the measurement of gravitational waves, but also with uh, um, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, we are testing classical uh, effects, classical gravity, and it's not clear whether uh, problems of quantum nature that have to do with reconciling quantum mechanics and gravity would show up on macroscopic scale, like the one at you know, the radius, uh, the size of these objects, uh, which is, uh, you know, kilometers, several kilometers. So it's difficult to probe. What I'm, I'm trying to say is that it's not direct the impact of this with, uh, you know, the kind of measurement we are making, which are more classical. So okay. maybe you can. Yeah, I can yeah. just reply. Yeah. Um, I, so I, if you had a, a big black hole, and if it evaporated down to half its mass, we would already have a problem. So, so uh, what we know is that there are uh, you know, contradictions with these three cherished beliefs, even for macroscopic black holes, if you let it evaporate uh, till, till half its mass. So, I mean, astrophysical black holes are not evaporating. So they're growing, so maybe they have none of these problems, and maybe you're right, there's, you know, everything that GR says could be true, and we, we could be avoiding it. But you don't need, you know, Planck scale objects or, or very tiny black holes to test it. Lydia? Yeah, maybe a comment on truth or reality. So being a mathematician, I would um, make the statement. So if you want to talk about something that is true or not, though probably that's only the case within mathematics where I can set up an axiomatic system and every step I take is either true or wrong. There's nothing else. Whereas in all other science, physics included, we only have a model as you just pointed out. And so the thing is, the type of truth which we are trying to talk about is what we have maybe um, the most common set about and have predictions about the future, understand how things behave the way they do. And probably I think I would not emphasis so much on uh, what's the true model. I think Newton, Newton's, Newtonian physics is as correct as it has always been. It's a limit within the bigger theory of GR, like GR will be embedded into a bigger quantum um, gravitation. And so far, I mean, GR has been able to predict and, um, well, many interesting features of black holes and probably to go beyond the event horizon. We do need another um, bigger theory. We just don't know enough. So whatever we call black hole, we don't know as the thing itself, but we are, um, what I'm interested in is getting to know more about it. Josh? Yeah, well, I'm just going to repeat some points that have already been made, but a slightly different perspective. I think to argue about the reality of black holes is missing the point. Uh, think back to Chandrasekhar, who you know, had such a, a beautiful way of understanding black holes as objects that can be characterized by three numbers. Um, and with the debate here about how do we establish uh, any other interpretation, I think the, the, the proof has to be on the other interpretations before worrying about the correctness or the validity or the complete uh, set of all possibilities for black holes. No other in interpretation uh, bears anything like the same evidence that we already have. And going back to Ramesh's point about event horizons, th the best test of that in, in the world of X-ray astronomy is, of course, the existence of two classes of binary systems that are very similar, one containing neutron stars and the other black stellar mass black holes, and the neutron star systems produce thermonuclear bursts at their surface. Uh, they're just practically indistinguishable in most other properties. It used to be we thought they were different, their spectra were different. They're very similar. They, the neutron star systems even have jets, which we didn't think originally they did have, but they produce thermonuclear flashes on their surface, which of course black holes do not. And to me that is just the absolute proof we need and we've had for years now that these things really are real. Very good. I, th I think you're right. We also have to look at the alternatives to black holes and to see how, how rigid um, the, uh, the, 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 the claim is that those exist. In some respect it has been done. Uh, for instance, for the galactic center, a, neutri a neutrino star can be excluded because that would be too large. 
given under the uh, assumption of the repelling forces that have been invoked previously, because it, it is being crossed by S2, by a star. And that would be on a Newtonian uh, um, um, Rosetta-shaped orbit after, the, after that. And that's not the case. Um, and similarly, the bosons, the boson stars, um, they have a problem in stability. Even if you can get it stable, uh, if you kick it, it will collapse. So um, there are ways to rule out alternatives, uh, at least theoretically, um, and that should be pursued uh, in a more rigid, uh, rid, uh, in a more in a stronger way. And uh, then, then what is left is then possibly um, a description as a black hole. So I want to kind of slightly switch direction at this point. So I think a lot of people basically said, we are sitting outside the horizon, and we have something like the no hair theorem. I would ask Mutau whether it's a real theorem or not, but I think for the rest of us, it is a theorem. The idea is when something collapses to this black hole or whatever with the horizon, the exterior world will only see an object that quickly settles down to this general object with three numbers, right? Q, M, and uh, angular momentum. But it still leaves open the question that Shiraz posed, and I think Carl was also kind of hinting, what is inside? You know, we have got these beautiful analytic solutions, even at the level of classical GR. We have these solutions, black hole solutions, and of course they are completely described by three numbers, and let us say the theorem, no hair theorem says, the outside world will be fully described by these three numbers. I don't think we still know whether the interior becomes the classical analytic solution or what does it actually become? This is an open question. And I don't know, maybe quantum gravity will solve it, but maybe not, I don't know. But there's all these questions about what's going on inside. Are we going to just say, ah, that's inside, we don't care, we'll only worry about what's outside? Or are we going to be good, honest physicists? Yeah, really worry about all of the physics, including the part we cannot observe, but at least come up with a consistent story. If I paraphrased Shiraz, I think this is sort of what he was getting at. So I was wondering if people had any thoughts on this. Let me start with Neil and then Satya. Yeah, as, you, as you heard in Pablo's talk, the numerical relativist's um, success came from avoiding the question of what was happening inside the black holes. Mm -hmm. But in principle, uh, they could push with different techniques, perhaps, to really look at what's happening inside black holes and uh, in you know, dynamic situations uh, to find out whether in more realistic situations you know, what really happens inside a black hole um, you know, during a merger and things like that. So it would be, I mean, the motivation hasn't been there because they've been looking to produce what we can see, not what we can't see. But I think that would be an interesting area for numerical relativity to explore just wouldn't have the usual motivations. Uh, I grew up thinking uh, our universe is whatever we can observe. If we can't observe, it's not part of the question that I can ask or answer. And th there have been ideas about uh, other universes, multiverse idea. I don't know what that means until somebody can tell me these are the observational consequences. So I go back to my original Point. Tell me what are those consequences. If you fall into your black hole, maybe you are convinced, but I'm not convinced. What is there inside? So I, I think that question is mute. What, what is there inside a black hole? Sorry. <laughs> Very good, okay, Gary. Well, I, I think we know that the interior of a black hole is not gonna be described by the usual analytic continuation, and that's because it's unstable. Right? We believe the exterior of the black holes are going to be stable, and the mathematicians will prove this, hopefully soon. Uh, but interior, you know, the, the most black, all, all but a set of measure zero black holes have some rotation, some charge, perhaps, and they all have an inner horizon in the standard story, which we know to be unstable. And so there'll be singularities in the classical description, which will cut that off, and uh, it'll probably be complicated to describe the exact nature of that. Okay, so you're saying you know the answer, that it is not the answer we already have. Yes, right? yes. Yeah, but that still doesn't give us a description of what it is. Right, but I think Dan had some comments on this. Yeah, it's true that it's gonna be a long time before we get to do the experiment where we uh, jump into the interior of a black hole and uh, see, see what's there. 
but I think that's really a bad argument for saying that we shouldn't think about it. Because I think, you know, thought experiments are really, oh, hold on, proving, we don't prove. Proving is not a thing that we do. So let, let, me, let me finish. So, so thought experiments are sort of the, in some sense, the best algorithm in, in theoretical physics for making progress because real experiments are very expensive. And you know, we could have, someone could have gone to Einstein in 1905 and said, why all this talk about trains that are moving at 99.5% of the speed of light? Because it's really hard to make trains that move at 99.5% of the speed of light. You know, it's very expensive and you have to, you know, you know, all, you, all this technology that we don't, I mean, come on, right? Like that's not a, you know, and to me the, 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 the description of the black hole interior is the central conflict in theoretical physics at the moment. You know, you take, you know, the algorithm for making progress in theoretical physics is you take the theories that we understand and you extrapolate them to a regime where it looks like there is some sort of tension, which is exactly what Einstein was doing with the trains. And then you think, okay, okay you know, how could, what, what kind of theory would we need to resolve the tension? And so far, you know, I don't know why this works. I have no idea why this works. But so far, every time that's been done, the theory that came out of it then turned out to have all sorts of other interesting consequences, you know, which were testable and didn't require us to make trains that were going at 99% of the speed of light. As long as you can make a prediction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eventually, yes, but that's, but that's, no, that's not, he was making predictions for trains that go at 99% of the speed of light, you know, those are predictions, they're not very useful, but... Uh, But we can also, in principle, go and jump in a black hole, right? I mean, it's, it's hard, and just like it's hard to make a train go at 99% of the Okay, speed. Avi. So there is actually a possible way out, and that's if um, we, we tend to think about a single black hole as the entity we are discussing, but um, if you shake it enough, if you distort it enough by a very violent collision with another black hole, then perhaps there would be some, uh, I mean, if the physics is not uh, as Einstein's gravity describes, uh, there is a chance that we'll either see a naked singularity or, and, and by naked singularity I mean we will be able to look through the horizon for a brief moment in time and that would show up in detectable signals like gravitational waves, maybe electromagnetic, whatever. Uh, or um, that, uh, that uh, just by uh, examining the response of the space-time, uh, there would be some signature of what's inside because sometimes when you shake a box, you can tell what it's made of. And, I mean, that's the way kids figure out what the present that they get uh, <laughs> for their birthday is. And so, so I would like to suggest this as a, now this is a, a future frontier because uh, as of now, we, we barely manage to solve Einstein's equations, but if, if the quantum gravity people come up with additional solutions, we can shake them up and see what happens. Okay, so Eric, you had a... I also think the interior problem, the problem of the interior is very deep and very, and very hard. And uh, I'm, I'm actually a little more skeptical, I think, than Gary about how certain we can be that the interiors don't have some of the pathologies that we normally rule out as being unphysical. I mean, think, think about a rotating, collapsing uh, you know, a cloud of dust. We don't have an exact solution for it, an exact metric for it. But you know, if, if it's if it's collapsing, it's 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 condensing. It's you know, conservation of momentum. It's spinning faster and faster. It's getting really really condensed. Eventually, it's going to start looking a lot like Gödel spacetime. The light cones are tipping over, and it's not implausible to me that once it gets you know compact enough and the light cones tip over enough, you're going to violate stable causality, i.e., a Cauchy horizon is going to form, and maybe any extension beyond it will have closed time-like curves. I don't. I mean, to to me, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, that's a concern of me that do you think it's a time to extend the definition of physics at this point? Because if we are so confident that black hole exists, that means the exterior of black hole exists. That also means the interior of the black hole exists. And uh, so if the we build confidence in the exterior, uh, there must something going on inside the black hole, which we might you still couldn't find any tool, but uh, something happens inside black hole. And uh, do you think, uh, because if we think about the history, is that Mark's positivism? I'm not sure, M Mark? 
mass positivism, so which was based on uh, very observation, and then we gathered confidence in the mathematics, uh, mathematical contribution in physics that we uh, include mathematical physics as a very strong tool. Uh, I'm not sure if, like, do you have to modify the definition of physics, like extend a little bit? Well, that's a big question. Uh, yeah, Mutau, then I'll bring it there, yeah. yeah uh, can I just uh, make a comment about this uh, new hair theorem? Uh, I think mathematically we call it uh, uniqueness of black hole. Uh, but I think, well, it's, uh, well, in every discipline, you have your reality check. And in mathematics, uh, our reality check is we look at the assumption and see if this assumption is, uh, is a sound assumption. And for example, in, uh, in the proof, uh, the present proof, making assumptions like uh, analyticity near the horizon, or, you know, smoothness of the horizon, and these are actually the assumptions uh, that mathematicians are trying to, to remove, um, you know, in order to get a, a, a but I, I think these assumptions may become relevant because we're, we're talking about quantum gravity, we're talking about uh, perhaps the, the more microscopic structure of, uh, of, of the horizon. And uh, so whether it's smooth or not, um, what is the regularity of horizon? And I mean, this, this theory is actually could become relevant uh, in the future. So this was also a comment on uh, the question you raised about uniqueness of black holes. So this complements a little what Mutau said. So the mathematical theorems right now have three unsatisfactory assumptions that shouldn't be there. And so one of them is analyticity. We have no proof that stationary black holes should be analytic. Second is that the uh, black hole is uh, not extreme. Uh, there's no satisfactory theory for extreme black holes, so there could be some other ones, not the, the current ones. And the third one is that it's connected, which uh, in this case is probably irrelevant because you're talking about a single black hole, but if you want to classify stationary solutions, you'd also like to exclude multiple black hole configurations, and that's, that's open. So there are three uh, three gaps in the theory. Uh, another comment about the interiors of the black holes is a, a fairly recent and beautiful result by Daphimus and Luke, which tells you that you have a black hole which is obtained by slightly perturbing the Kerr event horizon, then inside you're going to get a space-time which can be continuously extended across something which is very weak singularity. So the, in this CRM you get a, a singularity inside, but it is much, much weaker than the one that we uh, are used to think about. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm an observer, so when I think about the interior of the black hole, it's, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. But I do know that there have been some papers uh, by Steve Giddings and Dimitrios Saltis and others that talk about uh, how the interior states of the, of the black hole can be made manifest on horizon scales. And that's interesting to me, you know, as uh, working on the Event Horizon Telescope and I'm sure others that get down into the, the deep part of the gravity well, because maybe there is something to, to observe and we're not gonna know until we actually get there. And, and that also made me think about this, this triad that we, we circle around sometimes, which is sim simulations, and we heard uh, from Charles about that, and then theory, which we've heard uh, from, from a lot of people, and then observations um, that Andreas talked about. And if things start to make sense when you c can circulate around that triad, and they all reinforce each other, and they, they are, they're coherent, right? It's when you don't get any coherence that you want start questioning things, right? And, and uh, the last thing I was going to say is that when I think about observations, I also think that we're all siloed into these different methods, right? The X-ray astronomers don't often talk to the radio astronomers, right? Because they use completely different instruments, and you need completely different levels of expertise to build the next generation of instruments. And I think we may want to move more towards a line of coherently attacking this black hole problem I mean, from all different avenues, gravitational wave, radio, gamma rays, and trying to think about what the investments we should make as a community are in, the, in fashioning the best arsenal of tools we can to figure it out. You know, 
if it was just left to the X-ray people, they would say, well, we need these broadband spectrum, we've got to figure this out. And if it was just left to the radio people, they would want to build huge antennas on the moon, you know, and, and do a bunch of stuff like that. And, and of course, we've heard from Ray yesterday about the un unlimited aspirations of the gravitational wave community. Um, but what is, what, is the, what is the best way? And that's something that we might think about. I think we should keep in mind that we are um, also at a, um, a fundamental horizon that's a, that's a horizon between physics and mathematics. Of course, we can take the physical laws and uh, sort of um, project them into the, uh, into the black hole and we get a, maybe a, um, a, sac a satisfying solution. But that would then be a mathematical picture. It turns into physics if you can measure something. And in fact, um, Einstein had these trains which are difficult to produce but on the other hand, the trains then came in very cheaply, and that was, that was the muon lifetime, and that was the relativistic electrons that could be produced. So these were then the trains uh, with which those aspects could be proven or shown, or one could show that there is an agreement between the theory and, uh, and, and what we can measure. So um, I think we have, to, we have to find something that is measurable if you want to talk about black holes or even the interior of black holes. And I have to agree to, to what has been said previously. I think the um, gravitational wave um, compact object merging experiments that can be conducted now, these are very close to those experiments that may lead to some understanding of both the black hole phenomenon and possibly even of, of what is inside black holes. Okay, anybody else with some thoughts on these questions? I have a question on mathematics. So you mentioned this Deformos uh, work recently. So for me, it's always been very unsatisfactory that you go inside the black hole through the horizon and there is this Cauchy horizon, and we say we don't know what happens beyond that. To me, that violates physics. I ought to be able to tell what happens. So this new work that you mentioned, where they have a singularity, but it's a weak singularity, and did you say you can go through it? Does it mean you can actually extend uh, world lines and pretty much complete the space-time? Yes, you can continuously extend the space-time to a continuous metric. So if you don't worry about uh, tidal forces that you're going to meet when crossing this boundary, yeah. uh, which are not that clear uh, how strong they are, but they're certainly weaker than the ones in Schwarzschild. So you can continuously extend the space-time. All this is a uh, vacuum. All this is uh, completely classical. And, uh, but the Cauchy horizon problem remains. Namely, you're getting to a place where you know that no matter what, you're not going to be able to continue with uh, vacuum Einstein equations, right? So vacuum Einstein classical equations will fail at this stage in exactly the same way as they are failing in the usual strong cosmic censorship problem that space-time is extendable. It's not extendable through a smooth Cauchy horizon, but it's extendable as a continuous metric. But Einstein equations are unable to tell you what's going to happen next. Okay, so there is still a Cauchy horizon. So I guess this would be my question to the physicists here. We've got a theory that produces these Cauchy horizons. Is quantum gravity going to solve that? Because as I understand it, these Cauchy horizons are still not really at the Planck scale. It's just that you lost predictability at some point. If I haven't you know, understood it wrong, it's just that the equations don't know what to do beyond. They need additional boundary conditions or whatever. To me, that's terribly unsatisfactory, especially if it happens already at the classical physics level. So maybe, Gary, you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, no, no I, I, the curvature will still become Planckian. It will, OK. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is not, I mean, that's the instability. I mean, Piotr was saying that this is a much weaker singularity than we see in Schwarzschild, for example. But there is still infinite tidal forces for, for people who try to, you know, pass it. So there's every reason to think that quantum gravity effects will come in and be important. Do all the big physicists agree that quantum gravity is going to solve all these problems for us? Or can? potentially solve all these problems for us? Come on, Andy. <laughs> Andy, I'm looking at you. You've been awfully quiet. Uh, <laughs> I think the problem has been solved, but uh, we, by somehow, but uh, we may not be able to figure out what it is. 
but um, I mean, I think we shouldn't, in quantum gravity, the hope would be that there won't be any Cauchy horizons, yeah. right? Cauchy horizons is where, yeah, we don't know how to make sense of the theory with yeah. Cauchy horizons. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Can I ask a question? Please, Satya. <clears throat> so we are discussing mostly stationary black holes. I guess in a philosophical sense, no black hole is stationary. It is dynamical, something is hitting it or the other. Especially in binary black hole collisions, we have dynamical horizons. And I wonder what these questions would mean for dynamical horizons. Maybe some of the answers lie in understanding dynamical horizons better. So what's the status of that, either from mathematical point of view or physics? You know, where I come from, I you study I numerical relativity. <laughs> yeah, what do, what do dynamical horizons do? Uh, no, but actually, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think we know. Uh, I, I think this is more a question maybe for a mathematical physicist in the audience. Um, no, I, I don't have, a, it's, you know, I don't have an answer to this. Uh, recently, there have been a couple of papers that have tried to apply, you know, this idea of the dynamical uh, horizon, but I, sh I don't work on that, so I don't, uh, I don't know. Maybe something really simple. Does the area theorem hold for dynamical horizons? Is that a proved statement that they... It's not really, solutions are not really. Okay. Okay. So in particular, I don't think you can say only two hairs. A dynamical horizon that forms when two black holes merge have the memory of how they form. So at the early stages, their moments will actually tell you the progenitor properties. So in that sense, they are not, they're not the usual stationary solutions. Sure. So I wonder what, so but, uh, as, as he was asking earlier, a, a chair might have three legs or four legs or one leg, <laughs> and it is used for one purpose, and we can have actually infinitely many black holes when it comes to dynamical horizons. It's not just three parameter family. But the question you can still ask, let's say you found yeah, one of exactly. these guys, will the area of its horizon suitably exactly. defined, yeah. will that be always increasing or steady? Even for the dynamical yeah, case? Yeah, I think so. It'd be trivial for the stationary, stationary case. Okay. The area doesn't change. Okay, but yeah. he proved it for the for apparent horizon, I presume. No, 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 for the event horizon. Mm -hmm. I think there are... No, I think you guys should use the mic. It is true that area always increase, even in the dynamical horizon case. Okay. But I so, think, no, I just wanted to add one. Maybe the question is more, because in fact, uh, in some sense, everybody is talking about the stationary black holes here. That's true. Um, it, why? Uh, because, uh, I mean, in the sense, uh, it's for the first time in the last two years, we have signals from objects that, you know, are not actually stationary. And I was surprised nobody was saying anything about, uh, okay, should, are these still black holes, you know, when the two objects go around each other and reach almost the speed of light and collide? Um, we seem to be okay with that, so we agree that um, there will not be any difference between those two objects uh, and you know, being black holes as the final one, once it settles, it seems that mm -hmm. people have no doubts about that. <laughs> Nobody raised the point. Paul. So certainly, uh, with regards to numerical simulations, you always see the area increase to the apparent horizon. But with respect to what you were saying there, I think that's an interesting point. If we have some exotic compact object that has cleverly arranged itself, so it is just a, a few Planck, Planck distances away from the horizon, it would be a miracle if that could happen dynamically during a merger too. The, hori the horizon position is teleological, so how on earth could you have one of these objects uh, cleverly rearrange itself so it, it, it tracks the location of the event horizon? Uh, I would think that you would surely see a different, uh, a different gravitational waveform if you collided them. 
This has been the biggest problem with the firewall hypothesis, that that firewall has to form within a Planck scale of this event horizon, which as you say is teleological. You need to know the solution at infinity to know where the horizon is today. Uh, we could go into that, but I think we're getting towards coffee time. So let's discuss the teleological aspects of black holes over coffee. Thank you very much, everyone. I think this was a great discussion. Thank you.